Okay, so I'll uh, start. Um, I think uh, Munir is in the room. If there's any issue, you can ask him to message me on WhatsApp. Uh, I'm also checking on my WhatsApp as well. But I'll, you know, otherwise I'll assume your my audio is fine. I'll continue now. So uh, thanks for the introduction. I serve as the chair of the IEEE blockchain technical community. I'm also a member of the board of governors of the IEEE Standards Association. So I'll spend a couple of minutes. Uh, that's my LinkedIn. If you'd like to connect, please uh, scan the code and connect with me. Uh, as you can see on the right side, I've been actively involved in the blockchain space in the industry side last uh, six years. Uh, so I'm assuming a lot of the folks in the room are IEEE members. So I would like you to check out this uh, website, blockchain.ieeee.org. And please join the community. We have over 14,000 IEEE members, well, members, they may be IEEE or non IEEE. Uh, we have, you know, Collaboratech, Facebook, LinkedIn, X, Twitter, uh, all this stuff, right? Uh, by the way, we, this technical community uh, was officially started. Uh, it has a history all the way back from January 2018. Uh, it was a blockchain initiated under the future directions. And in January 2023, you know, the technical activities board approved the formation. It's basically a graduation of the blockchain initiated into a technical community and currently is sponsored by 10 participating OUs. You can see industrial electronics, uh, industrial application society is one of the sponsoring societies. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. Uh, you can see several uh, societies are actively uh, involved with us. Now, uh, we have done something unique. Uh, we have launched like uh, 60 blockchain local groups all over the world. Uh, local group is a new concept in IEEE. You just need two IEEE members to start a local group. And, you know, to stay active, they should organize. They're expected to organize two meetings per year. Now, uh, this is the, just to showing the steering committee. I'm the chair, and we have lots of volunteers involved. And these are some of the highlights of what we have done in the last, you know, five and a half years. Um, as I said, we have 60 plus blockchain groups all over the world, uh, about 13,000 members across our social media platforms. And we have been organizing events since uh, 2018. And, you know, we can, we have some educational content standards and all that stuff. And you can check it out on our website. Uh, in fact, this year, we are organizing a dozen IEEE events throughout, uh, you know, all over the world. Uh, so the, the way it works is, remember I shared with you these local groups. So some of these local groups, they work together and create an event. As an example, all the groups in India, like, you know, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Delhi, Mumbai, they all, I worked with all of them. We put together this event. In fact, I'm sitting at IIC right now. That's why I'm not there in person. Um, so this event is happening. Uh, and uh, we had over 300 registrations and all that stuff you can read, but uh, you just wanted to share with you that, you know, we have a very active blockchain technical community within IEEE. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join us, you know, talk to us. And, you know, that's, that's the message I wanted to convey the last couple, you know, two, three minutes. Now let's get into the topic, uh, blockchain. So before I get into the challenges, and I want to spend a few minutes, uh, some of the folks, you may not be familiar with these terminologies that we use in the blockchain space. So I wanted to spend maybe five minutes, give you some background. So even if you're not familiar, you can at least, you know, see what we're talking about. And then I'll get into some of the challenges. I'm sure you heard about some of the challenges like Bitcoin, energy consumption and all that stuff. Of course, regulation, I'm sure you heard about regulation risk. So I'll talk about those uh, today. That's the main topic. So let me get started here. Uh, so Bitcoin uh, was launched uh, back in uh, 2009. It's a, it's a software. It runs on a, you know, it's a peer-to-peer -peer computer networking software that's basically, you know, it, it was designed uh, to serve as an electronic cache. And it was, it's not something like completely came out of the blue. It was actually a combination of several key ideas uh, that have been in existence for many years. You can see the list here, like public key cryptography. Uh, and so on, which is of interest to this conference. And you can see the whole list of concepts that actually went into making this Bitcoin. It's like a recipe, uh, you know, that 
you know, combines uh, like the you know ideas from the fields of cryptography, consensus protocols, and networking. Now, Bitcoin, uh, you know, basically created a whole new field. We call it blockchain. Interestingly, in the Bitcoin white paper, which I actually shared here, you know, the author is pseudonymous. Uh, as a person, Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, they use the term chain of blocks. Uh, actually, they, the paper doesn't have this term blockchain. They talk about chain of blocks. And, uh, you know, from that is basically the blockchain term, uh, you know, came into existence. And, you know, blockchain, the way to understand the space, you know, you can look, up, look at as like it has gone through three stages of evolution in the last, uh, you know, 13 years or so. So the first one being blockchain 1.0, uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin inspired the launch of many currencies uh, to the point like some people took the Bitcoin code, it's all open source, and they made a few changes, uh, like literally 15, 20 minutes of change, and they launched a whole new cryptocurrency with a you know, multi-billion dollar market cap. And there were many, many cryptocurrencies that came into existence. All of them uh, are, you know, we call them like the cryptocurrencies and that's blockchain 1.0 so the way the bitcoin works is you have like a, an user a i can have an account and you know there could be an user in your room has an, an account and i can send you know it's a manual push i have to basically send you know manually bitcoin to your address right uh, that's like a manual process and in you know, around 2015 uh, folks you know there were like groups of you know vitalik and gavin wood they all uh, were working on you know, how do we make this programmable? Like, you know, some something happens and uh, externally, like, you know, whatever temperature or rain, some external conditions happen and then the transfer can happen automatically instead of a manual push. That was the programmable chain that we have the term here. So where you can basically create a code with some if then conditions and, you know, uh, the, you know, Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency will get transferred from this account to another account when something happens, right? So that's that's pretty basically what this is, uh, what we call as blockchain 2.0 and multiple blockchains came into existence like Ethereum, uh, public blockchain, Corda was a private blockchain enterprises and so on. And then blockchain 3.0 was like multiple architectures were created uh, to address the limitations of, uh, you know, the blockchain 2.0. Uh, now, let me see if I'm still there. Uh, okay, uh, seems like the internet is a little bit slow here. Uh, so I wanted to cover some of the terms, uh, like, you know, the DLT is a term that, uh, you know, it refers to distributed ledger technology and it, Basically, a blockchain and DAGs or data structures or sub types of DLT. And DLT is, you know, it's basically a ledger uh, that's running on a, you know, a distributed computer network. Now, if you want to get a perspective of how these all like uh, are connected, so DLT is a generic term. It refers to a broad category of distributed databases shared among multiple participants. And, you know, it's the ledger entries are updated through a consensus mechanism. See, I can create a Google sheet and I could uh, share it with everybody, right? Uh, in the room and they can all edit, but I can also, you know, create some kind of consensus mechanism, like for me to make any change, let's say I share the Google sheet with, uh, you know, uh, 10 people and, uh, you know, I, I have to make, uh, you know, I make it like out of the 10 people, at least six people must approve any change made to the Google sheet. Then now we are adding a consensus mechanism to it, right? That, that's what it is. We are, you know, it's the, all the ledger entries must be, you know, uh, go through some kind of a consensus process. And as you can see, blockchain and DAG are sub uh, types. They're all database architectures you know, DLT, blockchain, DAG, I mean, DLT is a generic term. So DLT is a database architecture. That's pretty much, you know, the summary of this. 
Now, there are different types. We don't have to spend too much time here. So this uh, blockchain is a linear type of data structure. And then we have a uh, DAG, which is like a, an acyclic graph architecture. Now, uh, most of the talks, you know, like the rest of the presentation will primarily focus on blockchain. Uh, so let's uh, stick to that. So now if you want to, since we have engineers in the room, so if you want to, you know, understand the key components, so we have a ledger, we talked about a ledger, um, you know, and then uh, there's a consensus mechanism or protocol that we talked about how, you know, it's like how the parties, participating parties come to an agreement on in the entries, ledger entries. Now, those are the two key things, right? Ledger, you have the ledger and, and then you have the consensus protocol. And of course, there are validators who basically are, you know, folks who would uh, approve the transactions or uh, entries that go into the ledger. Now, again, all of this is running on a distributed computer network. That's why sometimes, you know, we refer to this as a distributed ledger. Um, now, based on these two concepts, like the ledger and the consensus protocol, or you can you know, call it validators, you can come up with different type of blockchain architectures. Like you can see a ledger. Ledger could be public or private. So going back to the Google Sheet example, I can create a Google Sheet and make it public. Everybody in the world can see what's on it, right? That's, that's kind of a you know, similar uh, analogy here. And I can also make it private. So only people at the PK uh, conference uh, can see that, then you know, that's a private ledger. And then now, uh, as I said, the consensus protocols involve validators uh, who approve the transactions uh, that get entered in the ledger. It could be an open group, like anybody can actually you know, be a validator or it could be a closed group when you selected people can validate the transactions of a closed group. So basically with these four concepts we have here, like you know, ledger could be public or private, validators could be an open group or closed group you can come up with uh, different architecture types. You know, the public permissionless type are basically, you know, they have a public ledger and anybody can uh, basically join. That's like a Bitcoin as an example. And this public permission, the ledger is public, but only a small group can make change to the, you know, ledger. And this is a private, uh, where it's a private ledger, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, it's a closed group validator. So, a lot of the stuff we talk about, uh, you know, the governments and companies, they use the private type ledgers. And the, all the, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all those things you hear about, they fall in the category of either public permissionless type or per public permission type. Now, uh, the consensus protocols, you know, we have a whole list here. They fall into two categories, main, uh, two main categories. It could be proof of work or proof of stake. So proof of work, as you can see here, uh, it's a computational based. Uh, you have to solve some kind of puzzle. Uh, we will talk more about it soon. And proof of stake is like whoever has more tokens, like, you know, stake in that network. Uh, in this case, in you know, a token, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about tokens today. Uh, so those are the two concepts. Now, let me share with you uh, this graph where, you know, uh, this shows, you know, uh, the X axis, the number of validator nodes and Y axis, it shows the transaction per second. So roughly it shows you like where Bitcoin, you know, it's like there are a lot of nodes, but the transaction speed is really low. Uh, Ethereum, like, you know, also have, you know, several thousand nodes and, you know, it's like 20, I think 20 transactions per second. Whereas these are, these are public chains, right? And there are some private chains, like we talked about uh, earlier, uh, they're very fast because, you know, uh, they only have a uh, few particip participants and few validators and they're used by companies or governments. Now, let me uh, talk about some of the challenges, okay? So if you could uh, keep track of my time, you could message me in the chat. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about some of the challenges. So one of the main challenges that you keep hearing uh, is the energy consumption by Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, when it was launched, uh, you know, it was basically using proof of work. Uh, so, you know, miners are miners, they have to basically solve a puzzle and it requires running a lot of 
nodes, like the one I can, it looks almost like a data center. You see the picture on the top right corner, it's like uh, big, uh, you know, mining pools, they call it. They, they are solving this uh, puzzle to add the next block in the Bitcoin network, but they get rewarded for adding that. Uh, so it could be, you know, 200,000, 250,000 for just adding one block to the Bitcoin network. So in the early days, uh, you know, these nodes were run by one person. You know, I, and I, you, nowadays, you know, this has become a business model where you, you see there's lots of nodes, like 16,465 nodes as of today. Uh, but it turns out that, you know, a lot of those nodes are owned by a few mining pools like Foundry USA, you know, almost 30% of these nodes are owned by one company. And Ant pool, 22, 23% of these nodes are owned by the Ant pool. And we have F2 pool, which is like 14%. So it has become a business model, <laughs> this adding block, they call it mining, Bitcoin mining. And uh, now what has happened is it has become a centralized network controlled by, you know, a uh, handful of uh, networks. So basically, if you think about it, if you add the, mine, uh, the computing power, uh, hashing power, they call it, uh, Foundry USA, Antpool, and F2 Pool 3, you could easily exceed more than 51%. So if they were to collude, they could add the next block. So, you know, it really went all the way, you know, if you, if you go back all the way and check the uh, Bitcoin white paper, the there was a big assumption, as you can see here, this is the you know, uh, first uh, page of it. It's like, as long as the majority CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, that was the statement. But however, as you can see, a lot of those nodes are uh, nowadays owned by, and three companies can actually, you know, exceed 51% of the computing power. So that's a risk. And uh, as of now, the, the incentive provided by the Bitcoin mining uh, is keeping them from doing anything like this <laughs> in terms of colluding and adding blocks. Uh, so that's, you know, we call this centralization risk. Again, this is Bitcoin, but the same similar kind of problem exists for uh, Ethereum. Ethereum actually is moved from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and then it, it turns out that you can see on the graph, again, majority of the, of the tokens are you know, held by like one company. It says unknown, but it's all like one company or you know, Lido, like uh, almost 30%. So you can see even staking, there's a problem. There's a centralization risk. Not only that, a lot of those nodes, mining nodes, uh, sorry, these are staking nodes here, are run on Amazon or one of those you know, cloud services and cloud services are centralized, as you know. So you can see there's double levels of centralization going on in the Ethereum network. One is at the validators ownership, the stake, staking as well as the, where they're hosted. You know, it's being hosted on a cloud service. So interestingly, a lot of people don't really talk about these issues uh, you know, they still keep talking about like 51% attacks, this and that, but there are issues like this, like, you know, Amazon can decide tomorrow to shut down uh, these nodes. It, it did happen. There's a Germany, German cloud service provider called Hefner. One day they decided we're not going to host these Ethereum nodes and they shut all of them like down on one, like one day. So obviously this is not really a decentralized scenario. You and you can follow the logic here. Now let's get, get into some other uh, topics here. Like uh, there's a coefficient called Nakamoto coefficient. It, you know, it basically is a measure of how decentralized or centralized a, a blockchain is. And you can see some numbers. You can take a look at this to get an idea. Um, so when, when people use this term decentralization, you know, uh, question them because a lot of times people use this, overuse the term, uh, you know, and there's a lot of uh, details in it. <clears throat> now, um, this shows like an architecture of a blockchain or a DLT network. You have this, uh, you know, public blockchains like Ethereum, Cardano, and all that. And on top of it, you can deploy you know, smart contracts for DeFi, DAOs, NFTs, games, and so on. So it, you know, turns out like the lot of these smart contracts, 
um, computer programs and you know, deployed on these blockchain networks uh, have been prone to attacks. You can see, you know, a breakdown of hacked projects. Uh, this is a little bit old, but still gives you an idea. Like a lot of hacks, uh, there's bugs, you know, hacks happening at the at the application level. Uh, you know, the hacks you hear are typically at the application level. It could be like an exchange, or it could be like a DeFi. These are all the, what they call like they call it smart contracts. These are computer codes deployed on the blockchain networks. Uh, so that's the, these are things that's happening. And of course, uh, overall, this industry is facing adoption challenges because of the wallet interface, which is not that user friendly uh, for a common person because you have to remember like some you know like uh, twelve word phrase and hexadecimal like address and all that stuff. And it's it's just. You know, it's a little bit sophisticated and you know, probably for this community, you guys are, you know, you guys can handle that, but not a common person. A common person can't really deal with these kind of things, right? Uh, and also if you forget, it's gone. I mean, if you forget your private key, uh, you can, you will never be able to recover your assets. And it has happened. A lot of people have lost uh, their assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum just because they, you know, they forgot the you know, private key or they misplaced or lost, whatever, right? So it's, it's the, this is an issue, uh, you know, user adoption. So without solving this, it's really going to be hard for, for this technology to become like a, you know, mass to, you know, reach mass adoption. Now, there's also one more, I'm sure you, a lot of the folks in the room might have heard about this. Uh, cryptocurrency is, uh, is a gray area, depending on where you are. It could be a green area, red area, gray area. You can see the map here. In some countries, it's completely banned, right? You'll go to, you'll, they'll put you in jail if you do mining or anything like that. Some of those red countries, uh, it's a legal offense. Uh, it's a crime. And then in some countries, uh, you know, like in green, it's okay. And some countries it's gray, like US is a gray, you know. Uh, so, so, you know, that's another risk. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take it. And that's, by the way, that's my LinkedIn. Um, the right side is our blockchain website. Any questions? Is there a question? Thank you. You know, you had a slide on decentralization. Uh, uh, I cannot hear you very well. No. Somebody has to repeat you the question. You had a slide which compared all the uh, blockchains to Bitcoin centralization and decentralization. Can you go to that slide? Yeah, you're talking about the slide that shows you um, like a plot of number of nodes and transaction speed. Now you had set for Ethereum number two, number two, right? So yeah, my can audio. You I can't really explain. Do you have this very well? He's not hearing. Can you speak into the mic there and see if I hear it? Uh, no, uh, the, the, uh, uh, one of the slides was comparing the cryptocurrencies. Is that the thing, sir? Sorry. Yeah, maybe you can go up there. Yeah, that mic is better. I can hear. No, you had a slide which showed the comparison of all the blockchains to centralization on a Bitcoin. Can you go to that slide, please? Okay. Uh, is it a plot or was it? Can you go back four slides back from the last slide? Be, uh, before that. This one? Yeah. So now here. This is energy consumption. This one? This is one talks about centralization no, of no. Bitcoin. You were on that slide 
you go to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, here, uh, I, could you tell me what it would mean by this Nakamoto coefficient and Ethereum when you say it is two, what would that mean if you compare it to Algorand perhaps? Okay, so what it means is uh, number of parties in the case of, uh, let's look at Bitcoin here. Uh, how many, like, Bitcoin, you know, if you have 51% hashing power, means you can basically, you know, add the next block. How many parties do you need to reach 51%? You can look look here on this pie chart. To reach 21%, uh, 51%, you need three parties here, right? Foundry USA plus Antpool plus F2 pool. So, uh, you know, that's the, that's the way you look at it. Number of parties, I mean, you can go back and let's look at the definition here. You know, uh, is a minimum number of entities whose proportions can sum up to, to get 51% control. So in this graph, it's three, uh, okay? So this actual number, Bitcoin is not here. Uh, they talk about Ethereum. So you'd have to apply for, you know, Ethereum case, you have to look at the number of pools and see uh, I think in the case of Ethereum, it's not 51%, it's more like 66, 67. So that's how it is. Number of parties, entities required to basically, uh, you know, the threshold to add the next block, whichever blockchain it is. Every blockchain has different consensus mechanisms. The threshold is different. Uh, you know, if you want, I can send you, uh, there's a reference paper, uh, I can send you much details on that, uh, more details. Yeah, uh, the interest is for sharing the, uh, rev, I mean, reference paper. Okay. If you could, yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay. I'm good, thank you, right? Anything else? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, any Dr. Ramesh Ramdas.